called Yechad Kahal, and we're continuing our series on the covenant. As I said, you know, this series will consider, continue as long as I believe that Yah wants me to continue it, because there are aspects in every Torah portion that has to do with the covenant, and uh, unfortunately most people don't understand anything about the covenant. As I've also mentioned before, I made grassroots starter. doesn't mean that those who uh, are more into Torah than others, uh, you know, in their journey, will not learn something because these are topics, many of them, I've never heard any other teachers in my lifetime touch on myself. So, as we begin today, as, as I usually do every week, I try to wrap the last portion of the previous uh, Parsha so it begins to tie in to what happens this week, because it, so it gets that element of... Uh, Continuity. In Bereshit, Genesis 45-22, Yosef gives his brothers each new clothing, but to Binyamin he gives five sets of clothing and 300 shekels of silver. He gave them all none except change of clothing, but unto Binyamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five suits of raiment. What's interesting about this is... Uh, 300 shekels of silver. This is important as it correlates to Matthew 27, 3 through 8. Now, those of you uh, who really know their scripture are familiar with where I'm getting ready to go. And you've probably never heard this before. And especially since this is a two-house uh, teaching. Matthew 27, verses 3 through 8. Then when Yehuda, which betrayed him, saw that he was condemned, he repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, betraying the innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? See thou to it. And when he had cast down the silver pieces into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for us to put them into the treasure, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and brought with them a potter's field for the burial of strangers. Wherefore the field is called the field of blood unto this day. This 300 pieces of shekels of silver that uh, Yosef gave to his brother Benjamin, if you divide that by 10, that's 30 pieces per man. Each one of the 10 other brothers were involved in Yosef going down into Egypt. Now, Reuven was not there at the time, but he was a participant, even though he didn't directly deal with it himself. He was also behind those of throwing him into the pit because he, he was seeking to ingratiate himself back to his father because of his own actions with his uh, stepmother, Bilhah. So, uh, of course, Benjamin had no part in his brother Yosef's sale, as this is one of, the, of so many things in the Torah not studied by so many, and because of this, they cannot proclaim the good news as Yeshua and his Talmudim did. It is also once again pointing to future events pertaining to the ten lost tribes of sheep. Once again, uh, we've got some uh, written teachings available for those who do not know what it's talking about in Scripture when it refers to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Because the lost sheep of the house of Israel is not the house of Yehuda. Lost is not talking about salvation as uh, Christians think of it, but with ignorance of who they really are. 
They don't know who they are, so they don't know something's expected of them. Unfortunately, the people that it's expected of them, many of them don't even know who they are. Uh, most of you who have been drawn to Torah, who did not come from a Torah background, are probably because you're potentially descendants of the ten tribes. The ten tribes were made up of Reuven, Ephraim, Manasseh, Asher, Naphtali, Don, Shimon, uh, I cannot recall the other three at the moment, but they're the sons of uh, Yaakov. I didn't have that written down and I thought I could just pop all ten of them off the top of my head, but unfortunately I could not remember the last three. So, but that's who they are, is the twelve tribes of Israel are descended from Yaakov's twelve sons. Those who do not know, that's where that term comes from. Okay, the house of Yehuda is made up of the tribes and descendants of Yehuda and Benjamin. After the fall of uh, uh, Shlomo's empire, his kingdom, the, uh, it was broken into two parts. Shlomo's sins led to that. So, as we go, we're going to start out with Hosea chapter 4. Now, I'm going to be reading much more scripture today than I usually do because I want to touch on specific scriptures to show the things that people who are n new to what two house means can get a grasp. Now, Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom. He was not a Jew. He was of the ten tribes. And uh, some of you have probably heard this passage before. Uh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast refused knowledge. I will also refuse thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. And seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy Elohim, I will also forget thy children. The prophet Hosea is pre uh, preaching to his own people, telling them what Yahweh has said to him, and giving them what uh, Yahweh has said. And we'll move forward into chapter 8 of Hosea, beginning at verse 1. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of Yahweh, because they have transgressed my covenant and transgressed against my law. Israel shall cry unto me, My El, we know thee. Israel hath cut off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. They have set up a king, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold have they made them idols. Therefore shall they be destroyed. Thy calf, O Samaria, has calf thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will they be without innocency? For it came even from Israel. Workmen made it. Therefore it is not Elohim, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk. The bud shall bring forth no meal. If so be it brought forth, the stranger shall devour it. Israel is devoured. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. The northern kingdom was scattered among the Gentiles. This happens in uh, uh, recorded in 2 Kings. The last king of the northern kingdom is also coincidentally named Hosea, a different individual. But if you've never heard these uh, teachings before, and you have, you have heard, especially like Yeshua when he said he came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he's not talking about the Jews. And as long as you think he's talking about the Jews, you will misinterpret and misunderstand what Yeshua is referring to. And that's why he tells the uh, disciples that he calls, especially Kepha and Andro and uh, Yohanan and Yaakov, come and I'll make you fishers of men. These four men, their actual profession was fishing. 
and because they uh, attended services and heard the reading of the Torah and the half Torah, they would have been familiar with what Yeshua was referring to when he said, I'll make you fishers about who the fish are. It's not the fish in the water. And we'll go into that, and I will explain it as we go. We will now turn to Yeshayahu, Isaiah 28, verses 1 through 6. Woe to the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, for his glorious beauty shall be a fading flower, which is upon the head of the valley of them that be fat and are overcome with wine. Behold, Yahweh hath a mighty and strong host, like a tempest of hail, and a whirlwind that overthroweth, like a tempest of mighty waters that overflow, which throw to the ground mightily. They shall be trodden underfoot, even the crown and the pride of the drunkards of Ephraim. For his glorious beauty shall be a fading flower, which is upon the head of the valley of them that be fat. And as the hasty fruit before summer, which when it hath looked for, looketh upon it, seeth it, while it is in his hand, he eateth it. In that day shall Yahweh of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people, and for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength unto them that turn away the battle to the gate. Uh, Yeshayahu Isaiah predominantly uh, worked out of the southern kingdom, Judah, but many of his prophecies correlate to both kingdoms. Yeshayahu, Hosea, Amos, and Micah all were prophesying in the same time period. That's why many of their prophecies seem very similar and almost exactly the same in many cases. That's because they're given the same message. Now, a little groundwork here to kind of explain to those who are really, really new. And your knowledge of who the kingdoms are when it talks about the house of Israel and the house of Judah, those are two different things. That's not two different ways to refer to the same thing. They're all the same family, but they became two different nations. In 1 Kings chapter 12, starting at verse 21, And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathered all the house of Yehuda with the tribe of Benjamin and hundred and fourscore thousand of chosen men, which were good warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, and to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Shlomo. But the word of Elohim came unto Shemaiah, the man of Elohim, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Shlomo, king of Yehuda, and unto all the house of Yehuda, and Benjamin, and the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith Yahweh, You shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done by me. They obeyed therefore the word of Yahweh and returned and departed according to the word of Yahweh. Then Jeroboam, Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went forth hence and built at Penuel. And Jeroboam thought in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up and do sacrifice in the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem, then shall the hearts of this people turn again unto their master, even to Rehoboam, king of Yehuda. So they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah, or Yehuda. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold, O Israel, thy Elohim, which brought thee up from the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other set he in Dan. Now Bethel is not that far from Jerusalem, geographically. Dan was very up in the very far northern reaches of the territory that Israel was holding. That's how far apart they were. And this thing turned to sin, for the people went because of the one, even to Dan. Uh, Jeroboam, Jeroboam had intended that the people would go to whichever one was closest to them. But the people began to go to both. Also he made a house of high places and made priest of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam made a feast the fifteenth day of the eighth month, like unto the feast that is in Yehuda, and offered on the altar. The fifteenth day of the seventh month is the feast called the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of the Ingathering, or Sukkot. It is also known as the Feast of Dedication. 
So did he in Bethel, and offered unto the calves that he had made, and he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. And he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had forged of his own heart, and made a solemn feast unto the children of Israel, and he went up to the altar to burn incense. He moved the feast a whole month away. I can do whatever I want. And the calves it referred to here are golden calves, just like the one that was made in the wilderness. Wonder where he got that idea from? Oh, from his forefathers? <laughs> hey, this will be okay. It worked out so well the first time. But this is how the kingdoms began to be split apart. Rehoboam, or Rehoboam, is the son of Shlomo, Solomon. He gets to hang on to the southern tribe of Judah, which is joined by the tribe of Benjamin. This happens because probably uh, a lot of the uh, back and forth, especially between David and Jonathan, Jonathan, who was his best friend, and even after uh, his father Shaul was trying to kill David, David still had great respect for Shaul. And those of you who are not familiar with this, I'm going to throw a little uh, monkey wrench in here, that if you look in the Hebrew, you will find attached to Sha uh, Shaul's name and David's name the word Mashiach, because they were anointed by Shemuel, the prophet Samuel. That's all Mashiach means, is to be anointed with oil. You cannot be Messiah until you are anointed with oil. That's why Yeshua does not call himself the Messiah to any of Israel. You won't find him calling himself that until after the woman breaks the oil over him. The one woman that he does speak to and calls himself Messiah is a Samaritan. She's not even an Israelite. The Samaritans of that day were not Israelites. They were the people brought in to replace the northern kingdom. When the Assyrians conquered the, the northern kingdom, what they did is they took the people of Israel out and brought in foreign people and put them in. It was to disconnect both of the different peoples, Israel and the people they brought in to take their place, from the lands that they had originally come from. So they would lose their identity. They wouldn't have that tied to the land. It would be another land. Only generations later do their descendants begin to feel like that's home. Unfortunately, this is what happened to Israel when it went down into Egypt. And people say, well, you know, but he told Abraham that uh, his descendants would spend 400 years in the land not their own. Well, only part of that 400 years was in Egypt. And he never said that they had to spend 400 years, but that they would spend 400 years. They got comfortable. That's when the uh, Pharaoh who did not know who Yosef was turned on them. Hey, everybody else is my slave except these Israelites, these Hebrews. How come they're not my slave? I'll fix that. <clears throat> hey, you guys are slaves now too. As we move, what we want to take care of is in this week's Torah portion, in Bereshit, Genesis, chapter 48, we're going to read some verses here that some of you have probably never heard read this way, especially one. And I want to tell you, uh, those of you who want to challenge me on this, you go to the Hebrew, you will find the word that I'm going to point out when I read this. But the translation I'm reading from today, that's the way the translators translate it. I'm, today I'm reading from one of the translations of the Geneva Bible, which is older than the King James. In fact, the uh, Puritans who came and settled here did not want to use the King James Bible. They used the Geneva Bible. But, Genesis 48, verses 8 through 22. Then Israel beheld Yosef's sons and said, Who are these? And Yosef said unto his father, They are my sons, which Elohim hath given me here. Then he said, I pray thee, bring them to me, that I may bless them. For the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see well. Oh, his eyes are getting dim like his father's did. 
like uh, it says Leia's eyes were dim. Then he caused them to come to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Yosef, I had not thought to have seen thy face, yet lo, Elohim hath showed me also thy seed. And Yosef took them away from his knees and did reverence down to the ground. Then took Yosef them both, Ephraim in his right hand, and toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand, toward Israel's right hand. So he brought them unto him. But Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, which was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, directing his hands of purpose, for Manasseh was the elder. What's what they're talking about here is the right hand is the hand of uh, authority. When a, a son is blessed, whichever one he puts the right hand on, which is usually the firstborn, is the one who receives the, not just the double portion, but he receives the responsibility. Also he blessed Yosef and said, the Elohim whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, did walk, the Elohim which hath fed me all my life long until this day, bless thee. The angel which hath delivered me from all evil, bless the children, and let my name be named upon them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Yitzchak, that they may grow as fish into a multitude in the midst of the earth. But when Yosef saw that his father had laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he stayed his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Yosef said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the elder. Put thy right hand upon his head. But his father refused and said, I know well, my son, I know well. He shall be also a people, singular, a people, and he shall be great likewise. But his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall be full of nations. Oh, this word nations is the Hebrew word goyim. It is where the word Gentile comes from. He's saying that Ephraim's descendants will become Gentiles. They will leave the covenant. So he blessed them that day and said, In thee Israel shall bless, and say, Elohim make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he said, Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said unto Yosef, Behold, I die, and Elohim shall be with you, and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given unto thee one portion above thy brethren, which I got out of the hand of the Amorite by my sword and by my bow. One of the ironic, interesting things here, Yosef, who is not the firstborn, is complaining to his father that his father is not blessing his firstborn. <laughs> Remember, Reuben was Yaakov's firstborn. So there's a little irony here. Even with all the changes that have occurred in Yosef since his youth, the time he spent in Egypt, uh, in the imprisonment, the uh, time that he's been exalted by the Pharaoh to deal with uh, the famine, he still has a little issue here. He's expecting his father to bless his firstborn son. So, the word I said was in verse 16, that they may grow as fish into a multitude in the midst of the earth. If you look in the Hebrew, you will see the word dagu. Now it has extra letters in front of it, but those letters don't change the word. They are uh, meaning and and so forth. It, it uh, says vayidagu. But he's telling us that the fish that later will be talked about in Scripture, and especially by Yeshua, is specifically referring to Ephraim and Manasseh and those who are affiliated with them, which are the other eight tribes, which make up the ten tribes, Ephraim, Manasseh, and the other eight. So as you read uh, Genesis 48, verse 16, and if your translation does not say the word fish, the idea of multitude is not wrong. The other translations are not wrong, but they, they miss a very important key by not using the word fish. So, as we move on, that's why I now go to Jeremiah, or Yermayahu, chapter 16. And ironically, 
one of the verses, and the most important verse in this chapter, correlates right directly back to Genesis 48. And it begins in uh, Jeremiah or Yahoo 16, verses 14 through 21. Behold, therefore, said Yahweh, the days come that it shall no more be said, Yahweh liveth which brought, us, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But Yahweh liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had scattered them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Behold, saith Yahweh, I will send out many fishers, and they shall fish them. And after will I send out many hunters, and they will hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the caves of the rocks. For mine eyes are upon all their ways, they are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. And first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double, because they have defiled my land and have filled mine inheritance with their filthy carrions and their abominations. O Yahweh, thou art my fortress and my strength and my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the world, and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies and vanity, wherein there was no profit. Shall a man make Elohim unto himself, and they are no Elohim? Behold, therefore, I will this once teach them. I will show them mine hand and my power, and they shall know that my name is Yahweh. Okay. Jeremiah 16, verse 16, it says, And behold, saith Yahweh, I will send out many fishers, and they shall fish them. This is a reference to Ephraim and Manasseh and the totality of the ten tribes. This passage where it says, I will bring you out of the north. Many people believe this is talking about the house of Judah. But it's not. It's talking about the northern kingdom. The lands where he scattered them. He did not scatter the Jews the same way he did the northern kingdom. And we'll move on now to chapter 23. And we'll begin with verse 1. Woe be unto the pastors, or the shepherds, that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith Yahweh. Therefore, thus saith Adonai Yahweh of Israel unto the pastors, or shepherds, that feed my people. The word pastor comes from the word shepherd, one who works in the pasture. That's where the word pastor comes from, one who works in the pasture with the livestock. Ye have scattered my flock, and thrust them out, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit you for the wickedness of your works, saith Yahweh. And I will gather the remnant of my sheep out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their foals, and they shall grow and increase. This is one of the disputes I've had with some of the people who believe that only certain places, certain groups of people, certain colors of skin are Israel. He said, I've, I've scattered Israel through all the countries. When the return comes... If you're not prepared to see people with all kinds of skin colors, all backgrounds from various countries around the world, you are going to have a big surprise. And are you going to be ready to accept it? And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them. And they shall dread no more, nor be afraid. Neither shall any of them be lacking, saith Yahweh. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will raise up unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Yehuda shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby they shall call him Yahweh, our righteousness. These verses that people read, when you read about Yehuda and Israel, it's not talking about one group of people. As I said before, they're all the same family. But that family hasn't been put back together. The house of Yehuda and the house of Israel have not been rejoined into the whole house of Israel. As long as there exists a group called the house of Yehuda as a separate nation, then the restoration hasn't happened yet. Therefore, behold, the days come, says Yahweh, that they shall no more say, Yahweh liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But Yahweh liveth, which brought up 
and led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries where I have scattered them and they shall dwell in their own land. Once again, when every time until the restoration occurs it refers to the house of Israel. It's referring about the ten tribes or what's referred to as the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is not the Jews. The Jews aren't going to have to be gathered the same way. That's why those in the land, whether they're really Jews or not, as some people argue, once they came and accepted the confines of the covenant, because nobody's doing it perfectly, we're not under the new covenants wholly yet. If we were, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, which is teaching, which the new covenant or the renewed covenant says, when that time comes, when he's written it on our heart, no man will teach one another. So as long as myself or any others are teaching, the renewed covenant has not come fully into force yet. And it will not until the regathering takes place. Mine heart breaketh within me because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine hath overcome for the presence of Yahweh and for his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers, and because of oaths the land mourneth. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their course is evil, and their force is not right. For both the prophet and the priest do wickedly, and their wickedness have I found in mine house, saith Yahweh. Wherefore their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven forth and fall therein, for I will bring a plague upon them. Even the year of their visitation, saith Yahweh. What's interesting is most of the time, the word plague means a wound. And visitation means inspection. And I have seen foolishness in the prophets of Samaria that prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. Now he's directly dealing with the northern kingdom here where he says Samaria and the prophets of Baal. Now I have seen also the prophets of Jerusalem filthiness. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of the wicked that none can return from his wickedness. They are all unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Therefore thus saith Yahweh of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood, and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is wickedness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, Hear not the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, and teach you vanity. What's, vanity means something that's basically worthless. It's, it's common. It's like dirt. It's not dirt doesn't do anything or doesn't have any purpose but you know you don't go to buy food with a handful of dirt they speak the vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of Yahweh they say still unto them that despise me Yahweh hath said you shall have peace and they say unto everyone that walketh after the stubbornness of his own heart no evil shall come upon you remember the place where Yeshua said he came not to bring peace but to bring a sword that sword is to divide the people who are his people from the people who aren't his people. And the sad part is people don't realize that both of those people are both claiming to be his people. For who hath stood in the counsel of Yahweh that he hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, the tempest of Yahweh goeth forth in his wrath, and a violent whirlwind shall fall down upon the head of the wicked. The anger of Yahweh shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days ye shall understand it plainly. That's why so many of us in the Messianic and Hebrew roots believe we're in the latter days because more and more people are beginning to understand what Scripture actually is telling us. We've been taught lies and we finally begin to see through the lies because he opened our eyes. I have not sent these prophets, saith Yahweh, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, and yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had declared my words to my people, then they should have turned from them their evil way and from the wickedness of their inventions. A prophet is not someone who tells the future, has a vision, or performs some miracle. A prophet is someone 
who teaches the Torah or encourages us to come back to the Torah. The other things are his tools so that he can get our attention. Am I a Elohim at hand, saith Yahweh, and not an Elohim far off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith Yahweh? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith Yahweh? I have heard what the prophet said, that prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long do the prophets delight to prophesy lies, even prophesying the deceit of their own heart? Think they cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they shall tell every man to his neighbor? Excuse me. As their forefathers have forgotten my name for Baal, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream, and he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith Yahweh? Is not my word like a fire, saith Yahweh, and like a hammer that breaketh the stone? Therefore, behold, I will come against the prophets, saith Yahweh, that steal my word, every one from his neighbor. Stealing his word is telling them that his word means nothing and that they have a new word. Behold, I will come against the prophets, saith Yahweh, which have sweet tongues, and say, he saith. Behold, I will come against them that prophesy false dreams, saith Yahweh, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their flatteries. And I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they bring to pro no prophet unto this people, saith Yahweh. And when this people, or the prophet, or a priest, shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of Yahweh? Thou shalt say unto them, What burden? I will even forsake you, saith Yahweh. And the prophet, or the priest, or the people, that shall say, The burden of Yahweh, I will even visit every such one and his house. Thus shall ye say, every one to his neighbor, and every one to his brother, What hath Yahweh answered, and what hath Yahweh spoken? And the burden of Yahweh shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living Elohim, Yahweh of hosts, our Elohim. Thus shalt thou say to the prophet, What hath Yahweh answered thee, and what hath Yahweh spoken? And if you say, The burden of Yahweh, then thus saith Yahweh, because ye say this word, The burden of Yahweh, and I have sent unto you, saying, Ye shall not say, The burden of Yahweh. Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you, and I will forsake you, and the city that I gave you, and your fathers, and cast you out of my presence, and will bring an everlasting reproach upon you, and a perpetual shame, which shall never be forgotten. The burden of Yahweh is telling the people that Yahweh's ways are too tough. That's what these prophets are proclaiming, that nobody can keep Yahweh's word. So... We've got a different word for you. The prophet Yirmiyahu is also a Levitical Cohen, a priest. The two primary prophets of the Babylonian exile of Judah are both Levitical priests. Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, and Yehetzkel, Ezekiel. Uh, many people do not realize that Yirmiyahu is a priest and a prophet. Oh, how surprising, because that's the job of both of them, to teach the Torah. So, now we'll move on to chapter 30 of Yermayahu. As I said today, I'm going to be doing a lot of reading. And it's basically based on those who, even if you know something about two house, and about the northern and the southern kingdoms, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, even some of this you may not have heard and uh, been put in the light with all these other verses and chapters of different sections of Scripture. We'll be reading in uh, chapter 30, verses 1 through 11. The word that came to Yirmiyahu from Yahweh, saying, Thus speaketh Yahweh Adonai of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Yehuda." saith Yahweh, for I will restore them unto the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Again, these are the words that Yahweh spake concerning Israel and concerning Yehuda. Once again, he de declares that Israel and Yehuda are two different entities. For thus saith Yahweh, we have heard a terrible voice of fear and not of peace. Demand now, and behold, if a man travail with child, wherefore do I behold every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, 
and all faces are turned into a paleness. Alas, for this day is great, none hath been like it. It is even the time of Yaakov's trouble, yet shall he be delivered from it. For in that day, saith Yahweh of hosts, I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and break thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. What he's saying is that he will no more be the servant of strangers, people that aren't of the covenant. But they shall serve Yahweh their Elohim, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore fear not, O my servant Yaakov, saith Yahweh, neither be afraid, O Israel, for lo, I will deliver thee from a far country, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Yaakov shall turn again, and shall be in rest and prosperity, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith Yahweh, to save thee, though I utterly destroy all the nations where I have scattered thee, yet will I not utterly destroy thee, but I will correct thee by judgment, and not utterly cut thee off. Yahweh is promising Yirmiyahu, and the message that he's giving to the captivity period, those that were left in the land by the Babylonians were the poor. They didn't need any more poor. They took the educated, those who had any skills that they could use in Babylon, but they didn't need to take the poor with them. They had their own. So Yirmiyahu is speaking these words of encouragement, and he's telling them, hey, he's going to reunite us with the, the northern kingdom. Because he's speaking to the Jews here of the southern kingdom. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it's been about 200 years, roughly, since the time that the northern kingdom was exiled by Assyria. That's the north country that's referred to when it refers to the northern kingdom, Samaria, or the ten tribes. To the Jews, the north country is Babylon, both in almost the same vicinity. And now, a very important section, chapter 31 of Jeremiah, verses 15 through 40. And those of you who have never heard this one before, pay close attention. You may want to go back and watch it again. Better yet, even go read it yourself. It's real easy to read. Thus saith Yahweh, a voice was heard on high, a mourning and bitter weeping. Raquel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Now this is quoted in Matat Yahu. Raquel's children aren't the Jews. Raquel is not the mother of Judah. She is the mother of Benjamin. She was also the grandmother of Ephraim and Manasseh, Yosef's sons. Raquel is not weeping for the other ten tribes. She's weeping for those who are descended directly from her. That's what this verse is referring to. Thus saith Yahweh, refrain the voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith Yahweh, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. Now, it's not really Raquel that's weeping here. It's her descendants. It's saying that Raquel is weeping through her descendants. Benjamin is getting ready to go into Babylon with Yehuda. And their hope is in thine end, saith Yahweh, that thy children shall come again to their own borders. I have heard Ephraim lamenting. Thus thou hast corrected me, and I was chastised as an untamed calf. Convert thou me, and I shall be converted. For thou art Yahweh, my Elohim. Surely after that I was converted, I repented, and after that I was instructed. I spoke, uh, smote upon my thigh, I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son of a pleasant child? Yet since I spake unto him, I still remembered him. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have compassion upon him, saith Yahweh. And any of you who read these older translations like the Geneva or the King James, and you see the term bowels, the bowels are considered the seat of emotion in the human being, not the heart. To the uh, Hebrew mindset, the heart is the center of intellect. So when it says, love him with all thy heart, we would say in our culture, love him with all my brain. No what he says. Set thee up signs, make thee heaps, 
Set thine heart toward the path and way that thou hast walketh. Turn again, O virgin of Israel, turn again to thee, thy cities. How long wilt thou go astray, O thou rebellious daughter? For Yahweh hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, the Elohe of Israel. Yet shall they say this thing in the land of Yehuda, in the cities thereof, when I shall bring again their captivity. Yahweh bless thee, O habitation of justice and holy mountain. See, from verse 22 to verse 23, he changes from the house of Israel to the house of Yehuda. And Yehuda shall dwell in it, and all the cities thereof together, the husbandmen and they that go forth with the flock. For I have satiated the weary soul, and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Therefore I awakened and beheld, and my sleep was sweet unto me. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. Oh, that's not a good thing. To sow it with the seed of beast. Beast is uh, reacting however it feels instinctively. It has no reason. And said, as I have watched upon them to pluck up and to root out and to throw down and to destroy and to plague them, so will I watch over them to build and to plant them, saith Yahweh. In those days shall they say no more, the fathers have eaten the sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity, his own lawlessness. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Behold the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a renewed covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. Once again, this is two different things, and he's going to reunite that which has not happened yet. Because if it had happened, we would be in the time of peace. Our Jewish kinsmen in the land have faced nothing but having to keep a defensive posture since they declared their independence in 1948. So, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, the which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. But this shall be the covenant that I make with the house of Israel. Now he's talking about the whole house here. After those days, saith Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Do we all keep the covenant? No, we don't, so it hasn't been written on our hearts yet. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. This is the passage where I told you. The fact that I'm teaching and there are others out there still teaching means we're not fully in the renewed covenant. We're in phases of it, but it will not be fully implemented till the Mashiach has returned and gathered the ten tribes. And every man his brother saying, Know Yahweh, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sins no more. Thus saith Yahweh, which giveth the sun for a light to the day, and the courses of the moon and of the stars for a light to the night, which breaketh the sea, which the waves thereof roar. His name is Yahweh of hosts. If these ordinance depart out of my sight, saith Yahweh, then shall the seed of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. He said, if the, the uh, sun goes away, and the moon goes away, and the stars, there is no covenant. Thus saith Yahweh, if the heavens can be measured or the foundations of the earth be searched out beneath, then will I cast off the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith Yahweh. Oh, if we can ever find the end of the universe or find the center of the earth and measure it all out, he said, then his covenant with Israel will be no more. So, guess what's never going to happen? Nobody's ever going to find the end of the universe. Nobody's ever going to be able to figure out where the center of the earth is. To know exactly what the size of the earth is. Behold the days come, saith Yahweh, that the city shall be built to Yahweh, from the tower of Hananel unto the gate of the corner. And the line of the measure shall go forth in his presence upon the hill Garib, and shall compass about to go up. And the whole valley of the dead bodies, and of the ashes, 
and all the fields under the brook of Kidron, and to the corner of the horse gate toward the east, shall be holy unto Yahweh. Neither shall it be plucked up nor destroyed any more forever. The new Yerushalayim is a physical thing. Yohanan says when he saw the new Yerushalayim revealed to him, he said he saw a city. Well, if you're thinking of buildings, you're thinking wrong. A city is not buildings. A city is people. Doesn't mean there aren't buildings there, but it's not a city unless there are people there. And now we'll move over to uh, his cohort, Yechetzkel, Ezekiel, chapter 37. And I'm going to read the portion that was read in last week to refresh your memory, especially since it ties in directly with what Yermayahu just said about the renewed covenant. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Oh, I'm sorry, I turned one chapter too far. I accidentally turned to 38. The word of Yahweh came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, or ben Adam, or the son of the human being. The word man here is the word human, or humanity, or human being. Take thee a piece of wood and write upon it unto Yehuda and to the children of Israel, his companions. Notice here it says, the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another piece of wood and write unto, unto it, unto Yosef, the tree of Ephraim, and to all the house of Israel, his companions. Thou shalt join them one to another into one tree, and they shall be as one in thine hand. And then the children of Israel shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Now, I picked this translation for several reasons. It's the only translation that I can recall that uh, refers to the sticks as being brought into one tree. Oh, where do you think maybe Shaul got that idea? Because this is one of the ideas behind what represents Israel is an olive tree. Thou shalt answer them, Thus saith Yahweh, or Adonai Yahweh, Behold, I will take the tree of Yosef, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and put them with him, even with the tree of Yehuda, and make them one tree, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the pieces of wood thereon thou ridest shall be in thine hand in their sight. And say unto them, Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one people in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two peoples, neither be divided any more, henceforth into two kingdoms. Neither shall they be polluted any more with their idols, nor with their abominations, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned. And I will cleanse them, so they shall be my people, and I will be their Elohim. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Yaakov, my servant, where your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary among them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Thus the heathen shall know that I, Yahweh, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be among them forevermore. Now, he says, I will bring the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda together. Here in the Geneva translation, it uses the word tree. Most other translations use the word stick. You have two sticks crossed, like in an X or something similar to that, is the letter Tav in the ancient Paleo-Hebrew. This letter stood for a covenant. That is why one of the teachings I made early on is called X marks the spot. It was a play on the symbol of the covenant. It's not the only symbol, 
but is one of the most prevalent. That's why the Aleph and the Tav are so important. Now, we'll go back to Leviticus or Vayikra. As I said, you're going to hear a lot of reading today because I felt it was important for those who especially are new and do not understand what two house and the restoration is pertaining to Israel. Chapter 26 of Vayikra, Leviticus, starting with verse 1. You shall make you none idols nor graven image, neither rear you up any pillar, neither shall ye set any image of stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am Yahweh, your Eloheka. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am Yahweh. If you walk in my ordinances and keep my commandments and do them, I will then send you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall give their fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto sowing time. And ye shall eat your bread in plenteousness, and dwell in your land safely. And I will send peace in the land, and ye shall sleep, and none shall make you afraid. Also I will rid evil beasts out of the land, and the sword shall not go through your land. Also ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you upon the sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you upon the sword. For I will have respect unto you, and make your increase, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. Ye shall eat also old store, and carry out old because of the new. And I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not loathe you. Remember, in the tabernacle, that was the one place where the presence came to dwell. The presence of Yah. Also I will walk among you, and I will be your Elohim, and ye shall be my people. I am Yahweh, your Eloheka, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, that ye should not be bondmen. And I have broken the bonds of your yoke, and make you go upright. But if ye will not obey me, nor do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise mine ordinances, neither if your soul abhor my laws, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but break my covenant, then will I also do this unto you. I will appoint over you fearfulness, a consumption, and the burning ag to consume the eyes, and make the heart heavy, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemy shall eat it. <clears throat> and I will set my face against you, and you shall fall before your enemies, and they that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if you will not do for these mighty things to obey me, then will I punish you seven times more according to your sins. And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron, and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain, neither shall your land give her increase, neither shall the trees of the land give their fruit. And if you walk stubbornly against me, and will not obey me, I will then bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts upon you, which shall spoil you, and destroy your cattle, and make you few in number, so your highways shall be desolate. Yet if by these ye will not be reformed by me, but walk stubbornly against me, then will I also walk stubbornly against you, and I will smite you yet seven times for your sins. And I will send a sword upon you, that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered in your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I shall break the staff of your bread, then ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat, but not be satisfied. That's because there was going to be so little of it, or going to be so little of it. Yet if ye will not for this obey me, but walk against me stubbornly, then will I walk stubbornly in mine anger against you, and I also will chastise you seven times more according to your sins. And ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters ye shall devour. I will also destroy your high places, and cut away your images, and cast your carcasses upon the bodies of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. What's sad is the eating of the flesh of your own sons and daughters actually occurred when the Assyrians were besieging the northern kingdom before they took them into exile. And I will make your cities desolate, and bring your sanctuary unto naught. And I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. I will also bring the land into a wilderness, 
and your enemies shall dwell therein, shall be astonished thereat. The enemies will be so astonished that what Yah lets happen to them. Also, I will scatter you among the heathen, or the nations, or the Gentiles, and will draw you out a sword after you, and you shall be made waste, and your cities shall be desolate. He said, I'll scatter you among the nations. Not just one spot. I will scatter you among the nations. Then shall the land enjoy her Shabbats as long as it lieth void. And ye shall be in your enemy's land. Then shall the land rest and enjoy her Shabbat. The land's enjoying its Shabbat all the time when no kind of the house of Israel were in the land. All the days that it lieth void it shall rest because it did not rest in your Shabbats when ye dwelt upon it. And upon them that are left of you, I will send even a faintness unto their hearts in the land of your enemies. And the sound of a leaf shaken shall chase them, and they shall flee as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall, no man pursuing them. He said, I will strike so much fear into you that you'll run even when no one is after you. You'll think they're after you, but they're not. Then shall fall also one upon another as before a sword, though none pursue them. And ye shall not be able to stand before your enemies. And ye shall perish among the heathen, or the Gentiles. And the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away for their iniquity, lawlessness, in your enemies' lands. And for the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them also. And they shall confess their iniquity and the wickedness of their fathers for their trespass, which they have trespassed against me, and also because they have walked stubbornly against me. Isn't that nice? Therefore I will walk stubbornly against them and bring them into the land of their enemies so that their uncircumcised hearts shall be humbled and they shall willingly bear the punishment of their iniquity. Then I will remember my covenant with Yaakov and my covenant also with Yitzchak and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember and will remember the land. The land also in the mean season shall be left of them, and then shall enjoy her Shabbats, while she lieth waste without them. But they shall willingly suffer the punishment of their iniquity, because they despised my laws, and because their soul abhorred mine ordinances. Yet notwithstanding this, they shall be in the land of their enemies. I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly, nor to break my covenant with them, for I am Yahweh their Eloheka. But I will remember for them the covenant of old when I brought them out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their Elohim. I am Yahweh. These are the ordinances and the judgments and the laws which Yahweh made between them and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moshe. It says that we'll get so bad that we'll just get used to the punishment of our sins. And we'll no longer think of his punishment anymore. Oh, hey, we have all these diseases and illnesses out here among our enemies because that's just the way things are. That's just the way Yah designed the world. Yah said, no, he didn't. I didn't design it that way. That's very false witness to say that's the way things are. And now we'll turn to Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 14 through 21. Again, the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred, and all the house of Israel, holy are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Depart ye far from Yahweh, for the land is given us in possession. <clears throat> Therefore say, Thus says Adonai Yahweh, Although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, I will gather you again from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. The land of Israel. The land is not Israel, it's the land of Israel. And they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the idols thereof, and all the abominations thereof, from thence. And I will give them one heart, and will put a new spirit within their bowels, and I will take the stony heart out of their bodies, and will give them a heart of flesh. He says, I will do this to you, 
until you're ready to turn back to me. I will let these things happen to you because you insist on letting them happen to you. As I said, <clears throat> today's a little different. Most of today is involving reading with a little uh, commentary and explanation within where I'm reading. The next place I want to turn to is Micah, or the prophet Micah, chapter 1. As I said, uh, Micah is functioning in the same time frame that Yeshayahu, Isaiah, and Hosea are. And this will be verses 1 through 9 of chapter 1. <coughs> Excuse me. The word of Yahweh that came unto Micah, the Morishite, in the days of Yotam, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem, or Jerusalem. Shomron is the uh, Hebrew name for Samaria. Hear, O ye people, hearken thou, O earth, and all that therein is, and let Adonai Yahweh be witness against you, even Yahweh from his holy temple. For behold, Yahweh cometh out of his place, and will come down, and tread upon the high places of the earth, and the mountain shall melt under him. So shall the valleys cleave as wax before the fire, and as the waters that are poured downward. For the wickedness of Yaakov is as all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel, what is the wickedness of Yaakov? Is not Shomron or Samaria? And which are the high places of Yehuda? Is not Jerusalem? Therefore I will make Shomron, Samaria, as a heap of the field, and for the planting of a vineyard, and I will cause the stones thereof to tumble down into the valley, and I will discover the foundations thereof. And all the graven images thereof shall be broken, and all the gifts thereof shall be burnt with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I destroy, for she gathered in it the hire of a harlot and they shall return to the wages of a harlot. He's saying that Israel is going to prostitute itself. Therefore I will mourn and howl, I will go without clothes and naked. I will make lamentation like the dragons and mourning as the ostriches. For her plagues are grievous, for it is come unto Yehuda, the enemy is come unto the gate of my people, unto Jerusalem. Micah speaks uh, about both the northern and the southern kingdom here. Becoming a harlot, according to Yahweh, is having another master, another God, another authority other than him. When he talks about a prostitute or a harlot, he's talking about you've gone and worshipped other entities. You've gone and bowed down and did their will instead of mine. And most of the time, unfortunately, their will is their own will, that they claim some God told them. And now we're going to go to uh, Micah chapter 7 verses 1 through 20. Woe is me, for I am as the summer gatherings and as the grapes of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desireth the first ripe fruits. <clears throat> Excuse me today, I'm a little, uh, my tongue's a little thick today. I've got a little bit of a head cold, so uh, if you'll pardon me. The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none righteous among men, that they all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunteth his brother with a net, to make good for the evil of their hands, the prince asked, and the judge judgeth for a reward. Therefore the great man he speaketh out the corruption of his soul, so they wrapped it up. These are negative comments. The best of them as a briar, and the most righteous of them is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh, then shall be their confusion. Trust ye not in a friend, neither put ye confidence in a counselor. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son revileth the father, the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies are the men of his own house. Oh, does that verse sound familiar? If you'll turn to Luke chapter 12, verse 53, you'll read it there. Therefore I will look unto Yahweh, I will wait for Elohim, my Savior. My Elohim will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. Though I fall, I shall arise. When I shall sit in darkness, Yahweh shall be a light unto me. I will bear the wrath of Yahweh, because I have sinned against him, until he pled my cause and execute judgment for me. Then will he bring me forth to the light, and I will see his righteousness. Then she that is mine enemy shall look upon it. 
and shame will cover her, which said unto me, Where is Yahweh thy Elohega? Mine eyes shall behold her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. This is the day thy wall shall be built. This day shall drive far away the decree. And this day also they shall come unto thee from Assyria, and from the strong cities, and from the strongholds, even unto the river, and from sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. Remember he said Assyria, that's who scattered the northern kingdom. Notwithstanding the land shall be desolate because of them that dwell therein, and for the fruits of their inventions. Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage, which dwell solitary in the wood, as in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in old time. All three of these locations mentioned here were in the northern kingdom. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. The nation shall see and shall be confounded for all their power. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. Their ear shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms. They shall be afraid of Yahweh our Elohecha, and shall fear because of thee. Who is Elohim like unto thee, that taketh away iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his wrath forever, because mercy pleaseth him. He will turn again and have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and cast all their sins into the bottom of the sea. Thou wilt perform thy truth to Yaakov and mercy to Abraham as thou hast sworn unto our fathers of old time. This is a promise to the twelve tribes that I will cast your sins into the sea. Or anybody else who wants to become part of the covenant. As I said, uh, Luke chapter 12 verse 53 is what uh, comes from Micah 7, verse 6. When Yeshua said that, he's not saying something brand new. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's highly interesting that the more you read the rest of Scripture, the more you discover that there's virtually no new material in the Brit Adashah, or the Renewed Covenant, the New Testament. Now I'm going to turn to Yochanan chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to... No, I've turned too far. Excuse me. I turned all the way to Romans. <laughs> yeah, when you're doing this live, uh, sometimes even I miss my markers. <laughs> Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not in by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up another way, he is a thief and a robber. But he that goeth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he hath sent forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. There's other sheep in this pen besides his. That's the way they did it. Probably several shepherds who all lived in the town that had their own flocks would all pin them in the same area. That's why it refers to knowing the voice of the shepherd. And they will not follow a stranger, but they flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Yeshua unto them, that they understood not the things they, that which he spake unto them. And said Yeshua unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am that door. But me, if any man enter it, he shall be saved, and shall go in and go out and find pasture. The thief cometh not more, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and have it in abundance. I am that good shepherd, that good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. But an hireling, and he which is not the shepherd, neither the sheep or his own, seeth the wolf coming, and he leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. So the hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know mine, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep. Other sheep I have also, which are not of this fold. Them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one sheepfold and one shepherd. 
Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and have power to take it up again. This commandment I have received of my Father. He had the authority to be brought back to life because of his Father. He said he has one sheepfold, and there's one shepherd. Yeshua is the shepherd. My shepherd is not Paul. And the twistings that people turn his writings into. Shaul is a hireling. But he didn't run. It ended up costing him his life. Just like it did many of the others. The biggest issue that people have is they don't realize how important what uh, Yeshua says. Because he's speaking his father's words. All these things I read from the Torah and the prophets, those words came from the word made flesh. In the beginning was the word. When the word was with Elohim and the word was Elohim. The word is authority. If Yeshua said, I came not to abolish the Torah or the prophets, yet false prophets continue to this day to say that Yeshua did away with the Torah and the prophets. They're false prophets. Anti-Messiahs. Plain and simple. Anybody that tells you that if you're claiming to be under the covenant or you're saying you go by the New Testament because the word covenant and testament in the Greek is the same word, diathika. There's not more than one word. It's the same word. If you're claiming you're in the New Testament, you're also claiming you're in the New Covenant. There's not a difference between the two. Now I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 15. Now I know some of you don't spend very much time in Acts. This is what's called the Jerusalem Council. And I'm going to begin reading at chapter uh, 15 and verse 13. <coughs> And when they had held their peace, Yaakov answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. This Yaakov is Yeshua's own brother. Shimon hath declared how Elohim first did visit the Gentiles to take of them a people unto his name. Oh, he's talking about Israel. As he took out of the nations a people to be his own, Israel out of the Gentiles. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as is written, After this I will return, and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and the ruins thereof will I build again, and I will set it up. Oh, what's the fallen tabernacle of David? David is one of only three kings who ruled all twelve tribes. That the residue of men might seek after Yahweh, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith Yahweh, which doeth all these things. From the beginning of the world, Elohim knoweth all his works. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them of the Gentiles that are turned to Elohim, but that we send unto them that they abstain themselves from filthiness of idols and fornications, and that is strangled and from blood. For Moshe of old time hath in every city them that preach him, seeing his read in the synagogues every Shabbat. If you're not somewhere every seventh day of the week hearing Moshe read, you're not learning much of anything. Because everything that Yeshua said is in the Torah. Sadly, I've also had people say, well, hey, why do you keep calling... Paul, Shaul. Hmm. Interesting. How about let's turn over to Acts chapter 23. I've heard many people say that uh, Shaul stopped being a Pharisee. Which is not true. 
And this is uh, Shaul Paul has been taken in front of the Sanhedrin. But when Shaul perceived that the one part were of the Sadducees and the other of the Pharisees, he cried in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I am accused of the hope and resurrection of the dead. He just declared before the Sanhedrin, he is still a Pharisee. We'll move on to chapter 26, verse 5. He's before a Roman governor here. Which knew me heretofore, even from my elders, if they would testify that after the most straight sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. In Philippians, we keep going. This is Shaul that I'm quoting from. His own words. Philippians 3.15 let us therefore, as many be as perfect. I must have written the wrong verse down. I'm sorry. But there is a passage in, in Philippians where uh, Shaul repeats that he is a Pharisee. I am not spotting it right off the bat. But also, there is a passage in Acts that says that Shaul, who is also known as Paul, has frequently been taken. Hey, his name was changed, and it was not. The, uh, the sad part is... Those at the council, at the Jerusalem council, were all followers of Yeshua. And among them were Pharisees, including Shaul. This is not what many people are professing. I'm sorry, I did have the right chapter, thanks to the uh, gentleman who's doing the taping for me. It's Philippians 3, verse 5. Some, for some reason I wrote 15. Circumcised the eighth day of the kindred of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, by the law of Pharisee. Shaul is continuing to call himself a Pharisee. Now, as I said, if my friend would look up the particular passage in Acts there, where it particularly calls that Shaul, who is referred to also as Paul, uh, I will give that one to you, but I'll keep moving as a... Uh, in other things, but uh, in Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 8, it's one of the closing things that Moshe is telling the 12 tribes. Now, when all these things shall come upon thee, either the blessing or the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt turn into thine heart among all the nations, whether Yahweh the Eloheka hath driven thee, and shall return unto Yahweh the Eloheka, and obey his voice in all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Then Yahweh thy Eloheka will cause thy captives to return, and have compassion upon thee, and will return together thee out of the people, where Yahweh thy Eloheka hath scattered thee. Though thou wert cast into the utmost part of heaven, from thence will Yahweh thy Eloheka gather thee, and from thence will he take thee. And Yahweh thy Eloheka will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will show thee favor, and I will multiply thee above thy fathers. And Yahweh thy Eloheka will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed, that thou mayest love Yahweh thy Eloheka with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. And Yahweh the Eloheka will lay all these curses upon thine enemies, and on them that hate thee, and that persecute thee. Return thou, therefore, and obey the voice of Yahweh, and do all his commands, which I command thee this day. Moshe is warning the children of Israel, one day when your descendants, after many, many generations, have forsaken the Torah, will return to the Torah, 
because they will realize the problems they have are all because they have forsaken the ways of Yah. How many have forsaken the ways of Yah? Don't even know it. Because they think that was done away with. If Yeshua said he did not come to abolish the Torah or the prophets, that's exactly what he meant. Now the passage that I'm referring to, as I said, about our brother Shaul, and those who challenge say, well, why don't you call him Paul? Well, that's not his name. His name's Shaul. Verse 9 of Acts chapter 13, then Shaul, or Saul here in the Geneva translation, which is also called Paul, being full of the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, or the Ruach HaKodesh. He was known by both names. Shaul was his given name as a man of the tribe of Benjamin, affiliated with the house of Yehuda. As I said, I spent this week doing a lot of reading. And there's a reason behind that, as I said, especially for those who had not heard some of these passages. We're not familiar with how many passages in the Tanakh deal with the two houses and how they have not been restored yet. In Deuteronomy there, in uh, chapter 30, verses 1 through 8, Yah told us, He will bring back together. It will not be any group of people who do this. Remember the prophet Malachi, Malachi told us that, Behold, I will send the prophet Eliyahu before that great and terrible day. As I've mentioned on an a, a earlier taping in this series, that uh, our Jewish kinsmen, when they do the Pesach, Passover, they usually set a place for Eliyahu, Elijah. But we were discussing this yesterday on Shabbat. What if uh, Eliyahu isn't going to be one person? Eliyahu was a prophet of the northern kingdom not the kingdom of Judah. I will send the prophet Eliyahu who will proclaim to the house of Israel stop worshipping Baal and Ashtarah. Sadly, these two entities are represented by phallic symbols. Those of you who don't know what a phallic symbol is, look it up. Look up what the word phallic means. Yah said not to use these kind of symbols and call it worshiping him. But Israel's done that for a long time. But some within the house of Israel are beginning to turn. Are you the house of Israel, whether by heritage or by ingrafting? Because if you've been grafted in, you're in the house of Israel, then you're supposed to be doing the same things the rest of us are. Some of us have been regrafted back in because we were part of the house, those branches that were plucked off. Remember, in Romans 11, Shaul warned the, quote, Gentiles, don't be proud because you who have been uh, added to the tree, who've been engrafted from a wild tree, can be plucked right back out and the original branches can be grafted back in. You know, there's one olive tree, not two. There's not a Gentile part of the tree and an Israel part of the tree. There's one tree, one set of rules. That's what Yah tells us in Exodus 12, verses 48 and 49. When he says, if anybody wants to take up the Pesach meal who's not of Israel, he must be circumcised and then from that point forward must keep all the same rules that the 12 tribes have to keep. 
That's what the bread and the cup represent. So if you're drinking those, and you're still calling yourself a Gentile, what are you doing? Who is your authority? Who do you follow? And as you ponder these things, remember, he's calling. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And his sheep answer him. What shepherd are you answering? Are you answering Yeshua? Or a shepherd who, as Yeshua says in Yohanan, John chapter 5, a shepherd who's looking for another shepherd to pat him on the back and tell him what a wonderful job he's doing. Instead of seeking that pat on the back from the Father. Yeah. May Yah bless you and keep you. May He keep His hand upon you. May His face shine upon you. And may He give you shalom. Until next time, shalom. <laughs> Yahweh bless you and keep you. May the light of his countenance shine upon you, and may he be gracious to you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen.